Transit Joint Powers Authority meeting this day, May 14, 2015. Let's all stand and pledge our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Director Pedrozo? Present. Director Wall? Present. Director McDaniel? Present. Director Kelsey? Present. Director O'Banion? Here. Director Price? Here. Director Antonetti? Director Oliveira? Here. Director Samra? Here. Director Vialta? Here. Chair Thurston? Here. Oral communications. Persons wishing to address agenda items or comment on any item not on the agenda may do so at this time. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. Please state your name and city or community of residence for the record. For items not on the agenda, no action will be taken at this time. If it requires action, it will be referred to staff and or placed on the next agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to speak at this time? Seeing none, we'll move on to item four, oral report, Citizens Advisory Committee. Is uh, Christiana here? She, maybe she's late in the rain. If we see her, we'll come back to this. Item five is the uh, MCAG Governing Board Caltrans report. <clears throat> Again, it doesn't look like Ken Baxter. Yes, please. No, thank you for recognizing I'm not Ken. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm Tom Dumas. I'm the Chief for Metropolitan Planning in District 10, for those of you who don't know me. And those of you who don't should get to know me. I'm a nice guy. Anyway, um, just to let you know, Margie, I don't know if you saw today there was a letter uh, regarding local assistance program that they're going to do a local hiring um, they call it a local labor hiring pilot program. So if uh, there's a local assistance job and they want to use just local employees, there's a program they can go and try to set up preferences for that. Uh, if anybody has any concerns, I'd love to say call me, but I'm not the guy. It'll be local assistance. You talk to uh, our local engineer for that. But it looks like it's a good thing. Um, there's also been an update for some of the projects in April 30th, they sent you a letter on the update SB 45. Uh, two of the projects have been improved. There was a, the Merced Corridor Bridge Enhancements. Uh, it turns out Sonar's already got that one closed in Center. And the uh, Arbolita Drive project that they expected to be ready for bid in June is going to be ready for bid on Monday. So they pushed it ahead. Uh, other than that, I brought rain for you folks. And I think that's probably the best news I have for you. Well, it's washing down the streets anyway. I tried stopping it, but my foot didn't hold that much. Anybody have any questions for Tom? Mike. Oh. She, she may have to adjust the volume a little. Is it on it? Okay. Uh, Tom, there's one section over there off of uh, uh, out on 140 and Plainsburg area where there's the four-way, four uh, there's a two-way crossing where people from, I've talked about this before, where uh, people from the migrant camps got to have to walk across. And I had some, I had a meeting with uh, some members of the community this, this morning. And uh, is there any way we could get some flashing lights if we can't get a crossing, which I'm, you know how I feel about not having a crossing there. Yeah, I do. But if we can get some flashing lights there just to slow down. I think there is, but could you check into that? 
I'll, I'll see what I can find. I know okay. uh, we we had a planning study out there. Uh -huh. They also did right. a lot of what I can't honestly tell you that I recall if they've, they've come up with recommendations for a drastic change out there or what. Uh -huh. But I'll talk to our safety folks and see okay. if there's something they can do All about right. putting some signs Thank on. you. You're talking the kind that are just up on the post that flash yeah. and interact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes, Tom, uh, if you would extend my thanks to uh, Caltrans staff for uh, the meeting that we had in Los Vanos with the um, possible Highway 152 improvements. It's, uh, and anything that uh, can be done to uh, speed that project up would uh, be greatly appreciated. Because uh, I would, again, uh, defer to MCAG to see if there's any available funds, uh, because Los Vanos is becoming a critical area with the, um, with the traffic congestion. And, uh, and again, I thank you guys for taking the time to come down and, um, and meet with us to, to help us solve these problems. Thank you. I'll pass that along. Thank you. Anything else? Director Samer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not Ken, Tom. In uh, Livingston on Wynn Parkway, mm -hmm. uh, when you go from Wynn Park from the city towards the freeway, there, there's a, to go south, it goes, it goes two lanes and all of a sudden it stops and then about 20 feet later, the freeway and on-ramp on starts. Is there any way Caltrans can look at that and see what we can do to just make that two lanes because we got two, uh, we got semis, everybody trying to merge into one little corner just for 20 feet, you know, it's, I think you're probably aware of that already. I am aware of that. I recall when those projects came through in that area that developed that we brought that to attention that it, those needed to be improved and that, uh, well, it's still like it is now, and we have everything there. Um, but um, that is uh, something that needs to be addressed, and I'm not sure if it's going to be a locally pushed project because of the, the development that's creating the traffic that's needing to make those turns, or if it's something that can be a combination. But I will check with the mm -hmm. operations and, and see if there's any kind of funds that they might have available. Yeah, perhaps you can, you know, your folks can uh, connect with our staff and to see what we can do. It's getting worse now, so just. The, the problem is you also have, it's up on that hill, and right beside it is that steep drop off. And yeah. It, it's not just a simple go take the curb out and we're No, I understand, I understand. There's also a gas line, too, so. Yeah. But we just thought, I thought I'd bring it up to your attention. I, I appreciate that. We're uh, having folks, I was uh, at a, a meeting this morning when they were talking about the Livingston widening and all of that's going in the median, and I was mentioning to the engineer, I'd like to see if there's something we can do for that ramp, and uh, I was quickly told that, no, my project is right here, and they, it was really tough to uh, get her to look outside that corridor there. I understand. All right. But I'll try. Thank you. Anyone else? I guess that's all for you. Thank you. I, I will take it and run. Thank you. Uh, three questions is, is a lot for a... <laughs> well, it is for me sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Next item is the consent agenda, MCAG. It's an action item which will include the minutes of the April 16, 2015 MCAG governing board meeting, the unmet transit needs findings of fact for fiscal year 1516, the draft formal amendment number four to the 2015 Federal Transportation Improvement Program, MCAG Transportation Development Act Triennial Performance Audit for 11 through 14, miscellaneous funds budget for fiscal year 15-16, and the agreement for services between MCAG and YARTS. Does any of the board members have any additions, deletions, corrections? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Hearing none, item seven for information discussion only. The minutes of the May 13 TRB meeting, the altern alternative planning strategy update, one <coughs> voice brochure, and the commute connection monthly report for March 2015. Any discussion on any of these items? Seeing none, we'll move on number eight, the federal Tiger Grant application for a campus parkway action item to direct staff to submit a grant application. You want to give you want to give Mr. Fell a chance to lobby us, if you will. <laughs> I agree. There wasn't much to say. I'm um, just that we um, we have met with the city and the county on this application. 
we did make some efforts to see if we could get um, some funding commitments to have a better non-federal share. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to get those commitments or anything worked out in time for this application. Um, that was working through Assembly Member Gray's office. Um, so it's, it's a pretty similar package to last year. We're uh, proposing to only ask for 10 million instead of 13 million. That might give us a little bit of a better chance. The City of Merced did um, have the economic study updated, so we'll be including the updated study. Um, okay. So funding proposals in the staff report. Any questions for Mr. Fell? Madam Clerk, did you get the motion and second? Pardon? Oh. Good call. Anything further? If not, Chair will entertain a motion. Oh, we already did that, didn't we? Sorry. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Still fighting jet lag. For okay. Item 9, fiscal year 1516, final work program and budget. Executive Director Kern. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this is very similar to the draft budget we proposed several months ago. We had a workshop with uh, several of the members who wanted to attend to review the, all three budgets in uh, great detail, and I'm sure those folks learned a lot. Uh, but this is for the MCAG Governing Board. Uh, yeah. The two main, uh, two new elements that are included in this overall work program is to up update the short range transit plan. Uh, we basically implemented all the items included in our last short range transit plan, so this plan is uh, needed uh, sooner than we anticipated. But we received a special grant from Caltrans to do this uh, planning. So we got, I think, 125,000 uh, to uh, do this work, so we'll be hiring consultant services to do that. The other new element is the Rural Transit Alternatives work element. This is a valley-wide project. Uh, all eight counties in the San Joaquin Valley are included in this planning process of figuring out maybe there's a better way of providing transit in the rural areas that we can uh, look at and examine and possibly even do a pilot project on. You know, there's new technology out there with Uber and Lyft and smart cars and sharing cars. So we thought maybe um, this is an opportunity to start looking at those alternatives rather than always doing what we've always done in the past. So uh, again, we received a $500,000 grant for that project, and we are the lead on that, so <laughs> Matt will be facilitating that, and you'll see that come as we, uh, as we pro progress. But all the other work elements are the same as we've been doing for years, and we will continue to do so. This budget does not include any increase in the local, con uh, local dues, um, so that's, I think, of the concern of the local jurisdictions. So um, the, the budget is presented in the staff report and the attachments. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Kern? Director Walsh. Thanks. Uh, I just had a couple of questions, but Margie had answered them in advance, and one was related to the short-term transit plan. I w my question was, should we be doing that why we're still finalizing and working out the maintenance and operations things, and she was saying it's a more longer-term look, even though it's called short-term transit plan, it's more longer-term look, and so uh, I have a better understanding, so. Anyone else? Seeing none. This is an action item. Is there a motion? So moved. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Merced County Regional Waste Management Authority, item 10, minutes of the April 16th Regional Waste Management Authority Board meeting. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections to those minutes? <coughs> if not, Chair will entertain a motion for approval. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Item 11, oral report, Brooks Stayer. Monthly update. Good afternoon. Um, this is probably the last time you'll see the tonnage going up because we just heard Tuesday night that Stanislaus County approved the agreement with the nine cities of Stanislaus County. So Turlock is going to start going back to Stanislaus. We don't know exactly when, they haven't contacted us, but it, that will be a significant hit to the tonnage. And one thing I wanted to mention is our, we've talked about the productivity of the employees and how well they've done. And this is just a graph of 
the density of waste, which is very important. That's our, that's our bed and bread and butter at the landfill, is making sure we compact the waste and fit as much waste into the landfill cell as possible. So just to cut to the chase here, we were, when we started training the employees on the two new techniques, that was started in October, we were at 1,340 pounds. So in other words, based on our average revenue, it was $24 per cubic yard. And then we've improved that to 28, 21 a yard, which you think that's only $4, 393 a yard. But the thing is we take in 1,200 yards a day. So every day that's $5,000 times 300 operating days a year. We're saving almost $1.4 million in airspace that we can either resell or we're making more for the capacity that we use. And this is all done through the work of the employees in the field. It's 100% operating techniques and how hard they work. And I just mentioned Stanislaus County, that was approved Tuesday, so they'll, they'll be leaving. We just finished negotiating a contract with Paint Care and they will take our oil based on latex paint. We used to pay a vendor to take that for us and now the state contractor takes it and they pay for it, so it's gonna save us money. We've completed the recycling contract with Republic, and so hopefully that will in start July, June 1st, and that, again, that's gonna generate more money and additional savings for us. The draft EIR review, that's for the Valley Fill. That's about ready to be sent. We're having one independent party do a peer review of our work and the consultant that we originally hired and just make sure there's no problems with it and that hopefully will prevent, prevent challenges. And we gave a presentation over at Los Banos last week and it was very well received. It hopefully put, together, put to bed the issue of composting and refunding for not composting because as y'all know, we are using the green waste in a beneficial manner that saves money and that's the critical point. And now we resume composting but we didn't think there was any refund due for that. And then we spoke at the city county dinner and I think that was very well received. And we've had two vendors on site in the last couple of weeks, Dresser Rand and Capstone Regatta. And those are the companies that have these very efficient micro turbines. So you put the landfill gas into those, they make electricity and then hopefully sell it. So we're gonna have two hard quotes on what it will cost us to manufacture the electricity and then hopefully we can find buyers. And then once we s secure buyers, then we actually install the turbines and start making revenue. And then I just want to take a minute and talk about some of the upcoming legislation this year. <coughs> and, you know, it's odd to me coming from Florida again, because I think we had one bill in the last three years. And now, right now, there's 50 measures being discussed here. For regional waste. Yes, just for us. So um, the bottle bill is one you've all heard about for years. It's been around 30, 30 years and it's been amended 32 times and they're gonna amend it again because it loses about $100 million a year. The AB 939 diversion credits required us to hit 25% and then 50% and it's going up to 75%. It's still a goal, but they are continually talking about making it mandatory and hence they've made businesses and multifamily dwellings start recycling. They're adding mattress recycling, that's starting now. And that just basically means that there's gonna be a tax on every mattress sold and then the mattress vendors will get paid that money and then if the mattress come back to them, they'll pay for it. And we are gonna be re limited from our organics recycling of using it as alternative daily cover. That's gonna end in the next few years. Getting credit for it. Yes, getting credit. We can still use it, yes, um, thank you. We can still use it beneficially, it saves us money, but we will not get diversion credit. I don't think that'll hurt us. We don't use enough of it to make it, have it not be in compliance, but we'll see. And then AB 1826 is kind of a biggie because we have to start tracking, and this is the individual jurisdictions, so all the cities and the county have to track businesses and report whether they're generating organic waste, and this applies to lawn care maintenance and food waste, so it'll be grocery stores, et cetera, and report to the state 
businesses that generate eight cubic yards and then it'll go down to four cubic yards and eventually they want to have mandatory composting programs and these will have food waste in them so it's not the kind of composting we can do at the landfill which is regular leaves and grass so it will be a more stringent type of composting and I'm not 100% sure we can do it. Um, the single use bag ban or the 10 cent charge that has already been challenged and so there's they're trying to put it for public vote the idea there is that every jurisdiction can pass their own bag law so we don't need the state telling us that we have to do it and they're talking about changing the solid waste management fee of course right now it's a dollar forty a ton and if it goes up that's money we haven't budgeted for, budgeted for so hopefully this will get delayed uh, I just mentioned the mandatory organics the Air Resources Board is going to enforce stricter greenhouse gas emissions coming up in the future. Of course, we're gradually transferring everything to Tier 4 engines, and if we can convert our methane to electricity, that'll be to our benefit going forward. They're constantly talking about product stewardship and more of the mattress recycling type things, so businesses would charge a tax to take back their products. And they're also discussing a new tire regulatory fee that will be $1.25 per passenger tire. So, any questions on those? There are people that don't want anybody living in this state anymore, um, obviously. Walsh. Director Walsh. Back to the bills that you were mentioned. Those are bills before the legislature under consideration. They are, uh, that's a question. And are, are they on the governor's desk? Uh, some of those are already passed. Some of them are on the desk. I didn't use any, I didn't list any that were suspended or considered dead for the moment. Okay. So the ones that you listed were st are still um, active and moving through the legislature? Okay. At this point. Director yeah. Kelsey. <clears throat> hello, hello. Ooh. Um, I have a comment and then I have a question. The The mattress bill was passed. It, you yes. know, there's a lot of mattresses that are thrown out in the unincorporated area already. I don't think that if you put a tax on it that it's going to the make them bring it back. And then a lot of these mattress stores seem to come and go. So I don't know how there's any accountability regarding that. Where does the money go? It's going to go back to the mattress manufacturers. They, they formed a statewide, they banded together because they figured they'd rather get the money, I think, than the state. So they'll, they'll get the money and they will manage the process internally. Of course, Cal Recycle will probably see it, oversee it. So are they going to come out and pick up the mattresses that are out on Schaefer Road? <laughs> no. Uh -uh. The, I, the idea is it's the initial phase that I, as I understand it, is they will be required if they sell you to a mattress to pick up your old one, which most of them do that now already, but it's going to be mandatory. And then eventually they'll phase in that when they bring it back, they would recycle it. But right now they don't even have to recycle it. They just have to go get your old one and bring it back. Okay. Well, that was one thing. And then the other is that uh, recently there was a, I guess it was a garbage truck that turned over at Yowd Road and Highway 59, North Highway 59. And it went around the corner and the entire load spilled out on the right of way. And some of it was picked up, but not all of it. And I'm just wondering, you know, I had to have public works go out there and finish cleaning it up. What's the protocol for uh, the waste management folks, you know, picking up when they have a uh, spilled trash? Um, well, collection is up to the jurisdiction, so I haven't really delved into that, but they should get it, I, in my opinion. All right. Well, I just wondered what how to do that. I guess if I called them, they'd probably go back out and clean it up. But it was like a, the t whole truck, they went around the corner too fast and truck dumped out. So, But if, if that happens in the future, just call us and we'll, we'll definitely try to investigate. And find I had out public works on. go out there, but I wasn't sure in case it happens again. Okay. Thank you. Anything further for uh, Brooke? Seeing none, thank you very much. I guess you're going to stick around for the operating budget discussion. Next is item 12, which is the proposed fiscal year 1516 operating budget for Mr. Steyer. 
And this was similar to Margie's. We had discussed this, and I think you've had the draft for about six weeks. It remains mar completely unchanged, I think, other than the fact that we definitely put in that we will lose the revenue from Turlock. Director Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of questions. One, I think we're in the third year of no rate increase. That's a guess, but about. The last was? 12 to 15, so. July of 2012, I think, was the last, 13? Oh, 13, 14. See, I thought it was 12. Okay, sorry. So I was, I guess my concern is, is that um, I see a decline in our revenue streams. Um, and are we at some point using your crystal ball, uh, or, or, or using your Karnak the Magnificent, uh, are we estimating that we anticipate a, a, a big bump in a rate increase needed out in the future? And if it's so, I guess... At some point, as a public policymaker, sometimes it's easier to do it incrementally than it is to show up one day and say the rate increase has gone up 6% or whatever it might be and have to remind folks it's been this long since you've had another rate increase. So I'm asking, is there a process yes. we're going to go through in looking at that? Yes. Uh, in the budget was a rate study, and we've already called folks to get prices. So if this is passed, we will immediately proceed with a rate study to give you options. But really what it comes down to is if we had the crystal ball and could tell if the valley fill were be, would be permitted and the exact volume that they'll permit, because we do propose to raise the height a little bit to match phase six. So if they approve all that, we would not need a rate increase. You're right. But we won't know that for another 15 months. Got it. And if we don't get that approved and we have to go to 6B, it's six and a half million dollars versus 11 million. And so if we don't get it, we would need the rate increase and it might be a bigger one. So that's why we're recommending to consider a smaller, maybe a 5% next year. And then by the time that rolls around, we'll know whether we can do the Valley Fill or not. And, and in the discussions, it mentions that they're imminent capital projects. It is the Valley Fill that's the imminent capital project we need. That we well, we have to have a, an expansion at Highway 59 within the next three years. And then my last question really is just more, I think we need to look at it. So I see there's a reference to uh, the possibility of utilization of retirees, people who retire out of one system and come back to work for us. And I uh, just would share with you that uh, I think that kind of needs to be reviewed in light of uh, the impacts of uh, retirement reform and how many hours they're limited to and whether they can do that. So I just would encourage that we look forward, look at that. Anything else? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion for approval of the uh, budget. Second. Did you get the motion? Um, Director Adrian. Kelsey. Uh, okay. And Joe. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Mr. Steyer. Next is the Transit Joint Powers Authority for Merced County, item 13. It's an action item. It's the minutes of the April 16, 2015 Transit Joint Powers Authority. Uh, is there any additions, deletions, or corrections to the minutes? If not, the chair will entertain a motion for approval. There was Jerry. Jerry will come. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 14 oral report, Rich Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. I'll keep my monthly report short because we have some discussion items coming up. Um, I did want to mention that we had an excellent meeting with uh, the county a week or so ago um, about the uh, transition plan for maintenance. Um, they understand that we're, that we're working on uh, relocating the facility and that's going to probably take longer than we originally anticipated. So they're gonna work with us very graciously to help us transition into that um, 
we have decided that we would continue the relationship with the county for, for an additional three months so that we can bring somebody on board who would um, help with that transition and make that go as smooth as possible. Questions for Mr. Green at this point? Seeing none, we'll move on to <clears throat> item 15, which is the joint, Transit Joint Powers Authority budget for fiscal year 15-16. Uh, the budget's pretty much the same as the draft budget. There weren't any comments or any changes that needed to be made, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. <coughs> Opposed? Item 16, Development Act, Transportation Development Act, Triennial Performance Audit. Ms. Curtin. This is for information only. Uh, we passed with flying colors on our triennial review audit. Any questions on that? That was one of the things that accompanied the, the agenda. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> item 17 is an action item, transit operations and maintenance bidder selection. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Hopefully you'll be patient with me going through this uh, pr presentations, uh, about 18 slides. Um, but I felt it was important to go through this. Um, I first want to start with the goals uh, of the, the transit agency. We want to continuously com improve the, the bus. Uh, we want to always be at work towards changing the uh, perception of the bus, making transit a viable option for as many people as possible. Uh, of course, we want to be safe, not only for our passengers, but our operators <coughs> and the public as well. Uh, we want to help to develop and maintain this customer service oriented culture. Um, we want to make sure that um, our operators are not, uh, um, and, and our dispatchers aren't feeling like they, they answer the phone and they drive a bus. What they're doing is they're, they're helping people get to where they need to go. And we want to focus on helping people. Um, we want to also continuously reduce the number of delays and complaints we get. That's obviously going to be a goal. Uh, um, we are working on improving our paratransit system for our ADA clients. We're making some improvements there. We also want to have more buses available during our service hours, and I think we've had lengthy discussions about that. And of course, better monitoring of performance. We want to have a lot more data uh, collected and, and being able to uh, monitor and report on that. So keeping those things in mind as we went through this uh, RFP process, um, those were built into that um, proposal. I want to throw this slide up here to kind of show the previous contracts. We have had several uh, different contracts over the past 15 years or so for operations, um, and then maintenance and fuels essentially has been through the uh, County Public Works. So over the last seven months, we have uh, gone through this RFP process from authorization to release until today as, the, as we're coming to, for board acceptance. It was a long seven months. A lot of work went into this, but it was a very aggressive timeline. Um, we did a lot of work in seven months. I just wanted to kind of highlight the steps that went through uh, getting us there. We did have uh, six proposers uh, on a variety of different options between operations, maintenance, and fuel. Um, two of the proposers that proposed fuel recommended that we work um, with the local card lock vendors for fuel, and that would be a pass through through their contract. We felt that if we were gonna go that route, we might as well just have a direct contract with the, the fuel vendors themselves. So that's why that's in the agenda, is to, for us to negotiate that directly rather than go through a vendor. So we went through the process of administrative and financial review and narrowed that down to five um, for operations and maintenance. We did a peer review. Um, it was myself and four other uh, managers, uh, transit managers. Um, we had sent all the proposals out to them ahead of time with the scoring sheets. We met at a CALAC conference where I knew they would all be together. We spent close to five hours reviewing the scores and, and talking about um, the proposals and came up with our, our scores. One of the scores was a completeness and quality of response. Um, as you can see, they're all very close in score um, within a, a basically a point of each other. Um, we gave 50 points for technical criteria, and I'm listing them here. Uh, we wanted to know not only the experience of the company, 
but the experience of the key personnel we'd be working with. We wanted to know what their plans were related to safety, uh, asset and resource management. We wanted to know what their customer service plan was, uh, what their transition plan was, and how we would be collecting and receiving data. Maintenance was very similar, uh, except it was more focused on the, the fleet. What was their experience with uh, not only fleet management, but our particular uh, type of fleet. Um, and then um, consideration for hiring the incumbent uh, uh, maintenance employees, because that was very important. Um, safety and, and all, all the rest are essentially the same on the vehicle maintenance plan as well. So hopefully you can read this slide. Um, but what this basically tells me, uh, we went through this very lengthy, detailed process, is that a lot of them scored very close. It was, a, it was a very close uh, choice. We, we did operations and maintenance separate. Then we did a combined score because every one, every one of the proposers that we talked to said it was in the TJPA's best interest to have one operator that did both. They all agreed to that. So we looked at a combined score. Um, again, it was about a four point difference out of 50 points. So it was fairly close. Then we looked at a cost price analysis and because we put in the proposal that we wanted not only the five-year uh, contract, but we wanted two one-year options. Because we put that in the contract, we had to evaluate all seven years. So we looked at the totals there. We looked at the totals for, uh, for proposed for operations and maintenance. But in addition to that, I, wanted, I pulled out the other cost besides operator wages. Because we know we have to go through a lengthy process to uh, negotiate that so that's that's a, a variable component so that's what the green bar is is what is left over the, besides the operator uh, expenses as for DVE we gave five points for disadvantaged business enterprise uh, there was one proposal uh, a proposer transdev that proposed uh, six six thousand seven hundred eight six hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars in their contract which is about 1%, um, so they got 2.3 points. Um, national, we found out after discussions that they are planning on using uh, DBEs, but because it wasn't clear in their proposal, we, we didn't award them the points. So here's the proposal scores. Um, we, we looked at technical review, cost of proposal, past performance, completeness of response, the plan for hiring existing employees, uh, DBE and got a total score. So um, we ranked them specifically on their total score and even at this point we felt it's it's still pretty close so we should probably interview all of them. So we did that. We went through an interview process. We had the executive director, myself, and our grant analyst um, interview them. Uh, we had our procurement specialist there to do the admin of that. We interviewed all five. Um, we really wanted to hear from the key personnel what their, how much they knew of their proposal and what their plan was. Um, went over their staffing plan, the incentives, the training, uh, federal and state and ADA compliance, and then of course the transition plan, and then what added value did they bring to the table. After going through this process, we unanimously decided as the interview panel that there was no reason to change National Express from being uh, ranked number one. So we left them there. We did have some discussions about two, three, and four, and we, we altered their, that a little bit based on the personnel that they brought to the interview. Um, and that's essentially where we stand. So it's our recommendation that we go with operations and maintenance with National Express, and that we negotiate separately with the contract with Cardlock uh, vendor for fuel. Questions for Mr. Green? My last slide, sorry. Oh, sorry. So again, why National Express? Staff felt that they were most responsive bidder at the best, best price, best value. Um, they are a global company, that brings a lot of experience. Um, they have a lot of corporate su support. Um, we really like the experience and the commitment of the team that they were proposing. Their general manager um, has ties here in Merced, um, his son and his sister-in-law. Um, live and work here in Merced, and a couple of the other managers that they're proposing have ties to the Valley as well. 
Uh, they have a strong emphasis on safety and safety culture, and in fact, they've won several uh, APTA awards uh, recently for safety. They seem to be a very innovative and progressive company, which we like. We like the idea of, of constantly improving and changing. Um, they already have a travel training program, which is something we were looking to implement next year. Um, they're experts in our dispatching software. And um, they, their data management tools, they give their supervisors tablets to be out in, uh, out in the field with. Um, they do a lot of their, uh, their maintenance and, and uh, checkups on the buses with, with tablets. And they have a very strong asset management technology um, that we were impressed with. So I believe that was my last slide. Let's see. Yes. Questions for Mr. Green. Director Belalter. Technology. Uh, Rich, would you explain a little bit about the card lock system and which card lock system will be used? Um, I can explain to you what I know. I know that there are a few. There's Pacific and there's uh, like Bartlett, which is CFN, mm -hmm. um, because I know CFN has locations in, in Atwater, Merced, Los Banos, Turlock. So the buses could actually fuel um, while they're out in the field if need be. Um, that's the kind of thing we would look at. We haven't entered into negotiations with anybody just yet, but that's what we'd be looking at. So if it is CFN, then, uh, then uh, Los Banos and Merced and anyone that had that would be the benefit of the, uh, the card lock services? Is that correct? The buses, yes. The buses, yes. I, yeah, the buses. It would all be part of the same um, system. Okay, and then the, um, the, uh, the revenue or the, uh, from, from the, uh, the card lock services, then would that be divided among the, the cities that have the CFN? That's or would, it, or would I, I CFN... Uh, I, I'm not sure how that works. I, I don't know yet how that works either. That's something we'd have to look into and negotiate. Mm -hmm. So in, in our case, does Dust Palace have a... Okay, all right. Uh, well, I know we have a CFN uh, through uh, Windecker, mm -hmm. and so that would be uh, one of the options they could use for fueling? If that's who we negotiate with, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I would encourage you to try to spread around the wealth a little bit with the, with the fueling. Rich? Go, going on that same mind, CFN is also in Dallas Palace, Nicoletti Oil. And I think that what you need to look at, and, and they don't share. You can, you can fill up at every one of them, but the credit's going to go back to the one that you negotiated with, mm. where, no matter where it is. So I think you need to go out to bid as far as on who you're going to get to provide the fuel. Okay. Rather than just say CFN car lock's going to be the option. Uh, that's not fair to everyone. Okay. I think everybody in the county needs to have the opportunity to make a bid on that. They may not want to, but they at least deserve the, the uh, ability to bid on it. Because they all, they all pretty well get the fuel from the same places. It, okay. In this bidding process, there was an opportunity for people to just bid on fuel, and nobody bid just on fuel. And that was advertised well in the papers. And but so on. but what, what we'll do is we'll get three We'll go around and we'll ask for quotes and we'll bring it back to the board. Well, I think I think you need to make sure that you get it out to every newspaper in the okay. county of Merced. We will do that. Thank you. I concur with your idea. Director Walsh. I'll go after that. Um, you, you answered my question about the, uh, one of my questions, which was what's the process by which we're going to go out and bid and get fuel? And uh, I, I was concerned unclear about that. Um, in terms of the recommendation today, it appears that although we don't say it this way, but that low bid really drives this process. Because when we, you look at the weighting of the numbers, the cost proposal, other than technical review, is pretty substantial number. So if by chance I happen to be a bidder and I said I want to pay folks more money, I'm going to be in, um, negatively impacted in that review, correct? I mean, so it really is, and I guess my question was, I mean, I, I th 
looking at it, that seems to be the process. If by chance we said, as a policymakers, we like paying people more money, and we want to, and we're going to take the high bidder to do that, think FTA would give us a problem in terms of the fact is we're uh, paying folks more money to, to, to do this service versus going to low bid? Whether FTA is going to have a problem or not, I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to find out. Uh, I, I think we're. We I'm are. Asking you yeah, 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 yeah. Karnak. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> we are allowed to go through this process without uh, necessarily taking the highest technical score or the lowest price. What we need to do is look at everything combined, mm -hmm. and that's why um, when looking at the technical score, and the cost, and the interview process of who who we were looking at. It's those three things combined that allowed us to come to the conclusion of national being the one to choose. I included this green bar on this graph for the exact reason of what you're saying, is that I wanted to look at other things besides operator wages, because we can negotiate that, and I, and I think that we should. Um, I, I can't talk about that in too much detail, but no, no. I, I, I think there's opportunities there for us to do exactly what you're saying. It's, it's the other costs that, that drive the chart here. Well, I was just, I, I'm not asking us to negotiate here in public about yeah, how yeah, we're, yeah. I, I was just trying to determine when I was looking at this that it did seem like if you take out the technical review portion, cost proposal really drives it's weighted heavily in the process, so. Uh. It, it was fortunate for us that we had such good technical proposals. That could have been the factor. Okay. And then my other question is, we're awarding a bid today, or we're awarding a potential successful contract today for a five-year contract, mm -hmm. not a seven-year contract. That's correct, with the op two-year options. Right. Could it be that, is it possible for us to, I mean, do you have the cost price analysis on a five-year? Because that's really the, that's what we're being let. I, it's in my spreadsheet. I didn't bring it, but yeah. And it, it wasn't too unsimilar because, to this. Because the seven is like a two-year option, potentially, but it really is what we're being asked to do today is this successful vendor has based on a five-year contract issue, not a seven-year contract, so. Didn't, it's still the same ratio between the proposers. Each proposer had a lesser score on the cost over the five-year versus the seven, but it was still the same ratio between the proposal proposals. So they ranked the same, regardless if it was a five or seven. Um, but the option, I mean, basically you're approving the, the the potential for that sixth and seventh year. So FTA requires us to look at that because it's eliminating the bidding opportunity for those other proposals, proposers at that time. So we got to look at the whole picture and, and not and piece And I, I, w I would anticipate it wasn't probably going to change the, what, what, what was the chair's reference to that ratio or the? The ratio between the proposals. Right. Scores. I, I was at, but I just think that's useful information to us because when you're awarding a, a, on a five-year deal versus, we're not we're not awarding a seven-year contract today, so. I, and and I was technically you are. I, I started at the five-year, and my procurement person told me the proposal says seven-year. You have to do a seven-year, okay. so I I put that chart in the proposal, but it was essentially the same. Th thank you. Those were my questions. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. John. A couple things. Uh, first of all, where is uh, National Express from? Where are they from? <laughs> where are they located at? They are. I mean, everyone on here, I, I have no idea other than Merced Transit Company where they're from. Okay. I, I brought them here today if they wanted it. They could well, no, them. I know, but I, I'm, I, I'd like to know where. I well, mean, the I, bidding process has been done, and we where, where are they from? I don't, I don't have that memorized. Cincinnati, okay. Okay, having t uh, that that's fine. Then um, does does local being local 
come into play at all whatsoever? At because all? We're, because we're using federal dollars, we cannot use any local preference. Okay, I don't like that deal, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and then going back to the fuel, I know you said CFN, but also there's Pacific Pride. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a bunch of them out there. So I want to reiterate, when we go out, we want to make sure that everybody gets a free chance yep. at, at the bidding process. Because I, I, am, I am one that, uh, I mean, I like to see as much done locally than going out. Um, and for a few dollars to save, I mean, I think we need to take focus more on, on local. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Did you? I was just getting ready to make the motion. So. Any other discussion? My, my only comment would be, it's, are there any comments from the yeah. public? Oh. oh, Curtis. <clears throat> Did one of your buses hit you? <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm a, I'm a victim of uh, cruel treatment by a dermatologist. Um, Anyway, th thank you for the opportunity uh, just to speak for a couple of minutes. My name is Curtis Riggs. I'm the uh, president of Merced Transportation Company. And I just wanted to provide a couple of uh, uh, comments. I know the uh, your staff, uh, I think, has done a good job of uh, putting out this RFP, and I don't want to deprecate their efforts at all. Uh, perhaps a little bit as a matter of pride or whenever I want to say a few things just because of the way this, the scores came out, I can give you three uh, brief examples of, uh, and, and because they used outside, some outside uh, transit folks, maybe they didn't have enough opportunity or didn't take enough time to read the literal, hun literally hundreds of pages of documents that were produced by all of the vendors. But they came up with, I thought were some anomalies in scoring. One of them was um, past performance where my company received the lowest score. And, um, I'd be the first one to admit that uh, we're not perfect. And as you know, when you live with somebody, you get familiar, and I'm sure Rich is very well of all the things that we don't do as well as, as one might. However, the um, two of the bidders did have prior experience, you know, within the last 10, 12 years in Merced. One of them had a contract terminated after only 18 months. And then the, the other one, from whom we took over the system was found to be operating basically illegally using drivers that uh, were not properly licensed to operate the equipment. So, and this is, you know, I don't expect to change uh, the decision, decision here today, but I understand that a multi-billion dollar international company can look really good on paper, but it all comes down to who's really caring and doing the job for you locally. So I thought it was interesting that, that those other two bidders with a prior history of Merced got top scores when clearly their performance here did not merit that. <clears throat> the other thing I thought uh, strange was on the plan to hire existing employees, we were the lowest. Um, now I'm not privy to the other bids yet, so I don't know what they proposed, but mine was very <coughs> generous. We recognize that, that in the RFP, uh, Rich and the team really wanted to improve the quality of, of service for the bus. And I realized that to do that, we really needed to raise wages and improve things. So we proposed that we throw out our existing CBA with the Teamsters and institute across the board wage increases by as much as 27% to really make this a, uh, a place where people really were lined up and wanted, wanted to work. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to believe when we were proposing that, how we would not have a higher score than anybody else in terms of a concrete plan to <laughs> hire and keep our existing employees. Uh, the last one was cost, and I think you've, got, you've probably addressed it. The, um, I think that I understand that this is probably the most important element, um, and I know that um, I consciously made my bid more expensive um, than it had to be pr by proposing these wage increases. That's why I'm a little concerned. I don't know where I stand legally, 
when I hear that you can negotiate wages, I mean, if that was, if that's part of the process, then it would behoove me in the future to come in really low with rock bottom wages and then sit down and say, you know, we really can't do it for that. Uh, why don't you give me more money and we'll raise the wages. That seems a little bit like not a good process. So I, I throw that out to you. Um, my comment was going to be, I was going to request that you uh, wait until you saw the numbers for the five years, but it, it sounds like you have looked at that and it doesn't really change the, um, the ratio. So again, I, I can live with that. I, I respect your opinion and, and the things you want to live with or the decisions you need to make. Um, I'd like to add two additional thoughts on the cost, though, for your concern going forward. Our, um, let's see. Yeah, our, our bid was also high because we took very seriously the responsibility to meet all the terms and conditions of the RFP. And so we're, we feel it would be unfair um, if we lost the bid on price and then it turned out that uh, whomever you selected um, didn't end up with a contract that wasn't substantially in compliance with what you were saying was demanded in the RFP. So I think we'll want to look at the agreement you reach with a winning bidder to be sure that it is substantially what we all bid on. And then finally, I think it's important also because I've seen strange things happen in my industry before. Look at the hours of service and the formula that you'll get to for arriving at a cost per service hour because we all put in a number of millions of dollars to do this work. Our bid was based on 156,544 hours. And if the other bidders used it, that's the number that we think was asked for in the RFP. If your other bidders used a different number, that's going to change the cost per service hour. And so you're going to want to review that because the bids, the, um, you wouldn't want to take what appears to be a lower bid and then find out you're paying more per service hour than you would have with a higher bid. But again, I just want to uh, say those few things. I've learned a little bit in this process as well. And thank you for the opportunity. We've enjoyed uh, working for you over the last uh, five years and we'll uh, perhaps be uh, back here again in five or seven more down the road. But uh, appreciate your time and your consideration and, and all of your public service as well. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Ma'am, did you want to go ahead and come on up? Okay, I want to thank you for letting me speak, and please bear with me. I'm not a strong public speaker, but um, you're about to make a decision that is affecting the workforce of the bus. Can we have your well, name? My name is Kathy Pinnikuff. I'm a bus driver and a member of Local Union um, 386. <coughs> I'm a shop steward. But, um, I'm representing the voice of the workforce which is approximately 96 people. And I just typed up this paper and like I said, you're, you're making a decision that is affecting um, our everyday life, our, our jobs, our families and such. But let me just read this. Board of Supervisors, we employees of Merced Transportation Company, the bus, recommend that MCAG and the board award the contract to MTC. We believe this to be the best choice for the county, the bus system, and for us. We hope that you value our opinion as we are the workforce of the bus. We have come a long way in the right direction since MTC took over and only see things getting better. MTC has made many valuable improvements to meet the needs of our community, the bus system, and also their employees. We feel that if we change companies once again, it will be taking a step backwards in the progress of the company. Thank you. And 
just, I just, I know I don't have slides. I don't have, we didn't have a lot of time <coughs> to do research with the company that NCAG is recommending, but with the little bit that we did, and um, I've only been through the last two companies, uh, but I have coworkers that have been through like seven different companies, and we just, we just feel that, um, we hope that you just take into consideration that we, the workforce, you know, this is the way we feel. And I just thank you for letting me voice that. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, folks. I want to thank you for allowing me to address uh, you also. My name is Gaylord Phillips. I'm an employee of Teamsters Local 386. I'm also the lead negotiator for Teamsters 386, representing the 90-so uh, bus drivers that, uh, that work for uh, currently for MTC. I'm not here to lobby on behalf of anyone in particular, but I do know this, and you heard it from, from Kathy. The employees are very happy right now. And we want to make sure they stay that way. The one problem that I see with bus driving, I, I spent 30 years driving a UPS truck. And I just don't understand why it is a UPS driver delivering packages in downtown Merced is making $33 an hour right now. And a bus driver who's hauling around people starts out at 12. Now, we negotiated the last contract, Curtis and I, and Curtis came with the same basic attitude you heard here today. We want to improve the lives. That's my job, is to improve the lives of these people. And he came to the table offering to do the best he could with what he had at the time. And I'm sure that it's, whether it's he or whether it's national or, or whoever, I've dealt with almost, with, with the exception of national, I've dealt with everyone that's bid <clears throat> on this today. And uh, I do know that transportation is, Bus driving is, is, is something that needs to be looked at in our society because it's the same everywhere where drivers are making wages that just, just don't make sense. And so when you make this approval, I, I hope you take into consideration what the people are saying, and I hope you consider the future because we're going to be sitting at the table and we're going to be negotiating and negotiating hard to try to do something that should have been done a long time ago, and that's right or wrong. Bus drivers don't need to be working for 12 bucks an hour. They need to be making a decent livable wage. The top end's higher than that, but it just takes forever to get there. So I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. And I'm, again, I'm speaking on behalf of the 90 people that work at uh, MTC currently. And I don't know if Kathy said it, but there was 41 of them that signed that petition. They brought it to me. I told them they should bring it to you. So thank you, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Do you want to say something, sir? Good afternoon, my name is Mark Foster. I'm a vice president with National Express. First, I'd like to commend the staff. They did a very organized approach to the RFP process. And uh, I think, as I said, it took seven months and it was a very well thought out process. And um, we had, each company had an hour and a half interview that your staff put us through and we spent a lot of time and they asked a lot of hard questions and every company was required to answer those questions. One thing I just want to let you know, we're, a, we're, we're bringing jobs to Merced. Um, we're gonna have an increase in mechanics. Um, we're bringing back some management staff that is very familiar with Merced. As Rich said, uh, our general manager has family that lives right here. So we're very familiar with the area and we look forward to the <coughs> opportunity. Um, our employees, I think the staff would tell you that we talk a lot about our employees as internal customers, and we look forward to working with them to uh, uh, get a contract and make things better here. We're a very progressive company and innovative, and we look forward to uh, uh, helping you 
and us make the bus a, a much better system as we go forward in the future. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Anything further from anybody? The board? I have a question. Go ahead. Rich. So say this transition does go through, uh, are the employees gonna, the bus drivers that we have here now, are they gonna be employed by this new company? Yes, they will go through a, a, an, an interview and a screening process, which- Are they gonna uh, have first chance to? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything further? Carol, entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I make the motion to authorize the exec director to negotiate and enter an agreement with the National Express for transit service and operator and uh, bus maintenance. Because I think we're, we're going to bring back the item for the field later, so I'm not sure if you can really make that motion now. So we're just approving item A. 17A. Is that your motion? It's my motion. Is there a second to that? Well, to get this going, I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Let's have a roll call vote. Director Pedroso? No. Director Walsh? No. Director McDaniel? No. Director Kelsey? Director O'Banion? No. Director Price? No. Director Oliveira? Yes. Director Samra? Yes. Director Vialta? Yes. Director, oh, Chair Thurston? Yes. Six no, four yes. What, does any of the no votes, what do you want to do? Go through another nine month bidding cycle? I'm confused. Yes. If I'd like to make a comment, and I obviously the motion didn't go through, if we're not going to award to the lowest bidder, then what's the purpose of even going through the bidding process? We might as well not bid at all then. What's the use? Part of my question. Yeah, I mean, in this. In, I don't get it. In our city, we go through motions, and regardless of what it is, you award, you give everybody an equal chance at bidding. And once everything has been done, and then you go ahead and award to the lowest bidder because that's how we're supposed to do things. That's what the federal government expects us to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. We had a question earlier about, well, will FTA or will they allow us not to go to the lowest bidder? So we're now opening up a legal can of worms here by saying, what's the use of going through the process if you already predetermined the decision almost? I, I'd really like to hear rationale for some no votes. What, what do they want to do next? Director Kelsey. No. I'm holding it down. Okay, now it works. All right. My concern is that I want to be absolutely certain that it was apples and apples and oranges and oranges. And based on the comments that were made and also based on the fact that you know, there were no board members during doing any of this interviewing or analysis that could have brought back further perspective outside of the staffs, and it's not that I distrust the staff. It's just that I think that it's important for board members, especially the chair, to have full understanding of what's being proposed and uh, to sit through the process. So that's my concern and my comment. Somebody else? Yes, Director Walsh. Um, Supervisor Kelsey expressed one of my concerns, which is uh, exactly that, to make sure um, that we are looking at apples and apples and oranges and oranges and that if it was really low bid then okay then low bid drives it um, and secondly uh, and I don't know how the process works and so if there was going to be a protest process uh, to it might might board members sit in on that debrief d clarification process and so it really was making sure that we're, we're looking at apples and apples to, and oranges to oranges. And so that was really my concerns about this. What, what do you see as not apples and apples or oranges and oranges? I, I don't, which part of it? 
didn't match one to the other. Okay. Yes, sir. I don't. I don't think that is a case of question whether or not it was apples and apples. I think the main thing is that as far as on my vote anyhow was that I want to I want to assure that the process was good and clean and there was no problems with it, and I would like to see a reevaluation. Uh, from what I understood, as far as on looking at the the process, as far as on the the judging, <coughs> the judgment of the the applications, it was done at a conference or in maybe it was different but the information i have is that it was tied into a conference that folks had gone to and uh, they had some folks get together and evaluate them i think that that we need to make sure that the process is clean and it has been a, a due process for everyone so you're you're saying that the staff did not do a good job bringing us a clean and apples to apples recommendation I'm going to say what I said, not what you're saying. Well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. And I'm just saying what I, what I say, stated was that that I want to ensure that it is. How do you, how do you for process. for you personally? How does that? How do, what do we do to ensure to you that it's a clean process? I think we need to go back and have the staff work, and I think the suggestion that was made as far as on having a couple of the directors be involved in that, whether they're, uh, I don't care, I don't need to be on the thing, but uh, as long as there's a couple directors that are working with them, I think it's, that's fine. Thank you. I want to ask <coughs> council, are um, we stepping into Mr. legal Chair? jeopardy by this discussion and the, and the no vote? This into legal jeopardy by the discussion itself? No, I don't see why that would open you up to legal repercussions. Uh, you have not awarded the contract yet. Um, there's been a no vote in that uh, no vote at this time in that regard. I think it's up to the board how to proceed. That said, you did have an RFP and a process that was followed, and you do have protest procedures, and those are being followed as well. I think someone uh, already filed one. Or two. Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, just to understand the people that voted no, and I and I fully respect their decision, of course. Is are they suggesting that we go through the entire RFP process or? I fail to understand what they're looking at. Maybe if you can clarify a little further, whoever is, I mean, I thought that the staff asked everybody the same questions, everybody had the same answers. So I'm not sure, yes, there was a group, uh, I know it was mentioned at some conference, but I don't believe that was probably the major component. It was probably one of the components, but I don't think that was the only component coming to the conclusion of this uh, bid process. So I'm not sure how that even that small portion can really change the overall uh, the overall recommendation. Yes, it might be a small component, but I can't imagine that being the entire decision maker. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, so the protest process. Let me just kind of get clear so I, I understand. If someone has questions about the process, my understanding is Rich and team are precluded from sharing information about what was included in bids or not until which time as you have either a successful vendor uh, designation so that a protest can move forward. So that's a question. No. Uh, the Everyone, these are public records. so pursuant to a Public Records Act request or a Freedom of Information Act request, they could obtain copies of those documents before so, the contract is awarded. So if I was one of the vendors and wanted to have a discussion with how did you get to my rating, we could do that process. Yes, and that is a debriefing process. That's not a formal protest. It's distinguishable from a formal protest, but it is an opportunity for people to sit down with staff and discuss how their score was arrived at. Um, they also have the option to file a pre-award protest that is separate from the debriefing. So they have the option to do both. Um, so debriefing, just pardon me for interrupting for mm -hmm. making sure I'm clear. So a debriefing with, with the folks in terms of the process is not necessarily tied to a, pro, uh, what did you use the a term, pre-protest? A pre-award pre or a post-award protest. Okay. Although from my experience with McDonnell Douglas, debriefings were done after there was an award. 
Um, in this case, the debriefing can be done before the uh, before the contract is actually awarded. It's basically, I believe we've had several requests for debriefing from parties in this. What's the length of the protest time? Uh, it is short. Um, the pre-award protest has to be received within five days of the uh, notice of intent to award. Um, after the contract is awarded, there's an additional five days for a protest there. Uh, it's two different protests, although they are tied together in that but filing a pre-award protest is required to pursue legal action if you are unsuccessful in a post-award protest. What's the date that's uh, starting the intent to award? The notice of intent to award went out on... I'm not sure. Uh, when the board agenda went out, we released that notice of intent to award. How many days has run then? So it was, it's been over, it's been five days. So it's been more than five days. Uh, so the next protest would be what? If, well, the next protest isn't until the contract is actually awarded, awarded. but if you went into an additional evaluation process, that would still restart all of those timelines. So, for clarification purposes, so if, if, if the board was so inclined to suggest that we have a debriefing process, that we could make uh, a decision today of, to, for lack of a note, tentatively award, I don't know what the, that's the right term, but to, to tentatively award and then afford the opportunity for those folks who want to have a debrief and then bring the final award back to us after that debriefing. The suggestion, I'm, if that's, th then board members, and I'll, not to throw anybody else under the bus, but <laughs> maybe the chair and vice chair would sit in on those debriefings as a possibility. That's a possibility, yes. Is that, okay, but I'd, at this point, if you don't mind, I'd, I'll, I mean, if the, you no one else has comments. I'll make a motion. I'll, I'll th may I recommend that the motion be to authorize staff to enter into negotiations with National Express while this process is also going on? I'm, I'm dependent upon counsel to make sure that uh, the uh, motion is uh, appropriate. So whatever are the words that I need to use to, because oh. the concept is final award would be brought back to us upon a, a subsequent to debriefing. So my motion would include, as council has suggested, um, that we'd go through a process. We recommend uh, authorizing the exec staff to negotiate and enter into, uh, begin to enter into an agreement with National Express and then afford those vendors who would like to debrief with, with staff over the process and have and ask that the chair and vice chair uh, participate in that, those debriefings. Is that okay with you, Director Kelsey? Okay. Um, Question. For clarification, uh, just for purposes of the protest procedures, would this include a uh, an extension, essentially, of the time to file a pre-award protest? Uh, if council suggests that might be appropriate, I'd be more than willing to include it in my motion. That gets a little convoluted. It, it does get convoluted, but it gets convoluted for a reason. It's because in our current protest procedures, a pre-award protest is required to be filed in order to preserve the right to pursue legal action in court after a post-award protest, in which case it wouldn't make a lot of sense for you to continue this evaluation process with the pre-award protest procedure, a pre yeah. pre pre protest period closed at this point. Are we just going to toll it, or do you want to put new dates on it? I well, I guess it depends in large part on when this process really gets started. Um, it could take a week or two, and they, the five mm -hmm. days doesn't so really what if we notify the bidders of this opportunity? How about, how about at some point bid. issuing a new intent to award? That's, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Then I would include that in my motion that I would, that we would, if a board is inclined, <laughs> that we would issue a new intent to award, which then starts the clock the pre or the pre, right. of also affording vendors who are interested in debriefing on the process and that 
the chair and the vice chair participate in the staff review of that a debriefing. That would be my motion. Question? Yes. Oh. Can, can, can you state that uh, no. entire motion one time, please? <laughs> Because it kind of split up, and I'm kind of okay. Gonna I was trying to, to, to if you don't mind, please, for record, everybody becomes really clear at the time. She has a. Are you going to read it back? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, the executive let, director. Let me try. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to reorder it because it will make more sense to me that um, that you're directing staff to withdraw the original intent to award and reissue the intent to award to National Express that will restart that clock per our protest procedures, that you're directing staff to negotiate as identified in the staff report. I'll start, let me interrupt. Excuse me. I don't think we were going to issue that until after the debriefs. Okay. Because uh, we're, we're not going to get all that done in five days. Is that, is that okay? Okay. Council? Mm-hmm. So um, then I'm un not understanding. So I, I thought you were authorizing the executive director to begin negotiations with National Express, and you'll come. We'll come back to the board with a final contract at your next meeting, if if that continues on. But we're going to allow the other bidders to get their five days. Do you want to try to interpret what's going? No, I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> easy, easy. So go. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, we are going through a debrief, debrief process with, with most of the, all the vendors already. Uh, this is a process where we will provide them, you know, hard copies of all of our uh, score sheets with notes, everything that we've done through this process. We are, we are already doing that for all of them. They've all requested that. So th that's already happening, the debrief. But we, they want the participation of the chair and the vice chair in the in the actual, you know, I think it's a 15, 10, 15 minute yeah, it's phone call phone with calls. the proposers and um, uh, we can have the chair and the vice chair participate in that. Um, okay, so tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. We're authorizing the executive director and staff to enter into negotiations with National Express for the contract. Correct. We're, we're gonna, at some point, finish the debrief which include the chair and vice chair. At the end of the, upon completion of the debrief, we can issue an intent to award, okay. which starts the five-day okay. uh, pre, pre-award uh, protest. And what was the next? Anything left? If you would like us to come back to the board at your and, next meeting. And bring a, the final agreement back to the board. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? Is that okay? Uh, before before we go to the vote, let's have a question for legal. I'm sorry. Yes. Just a question, and I'm using a hypothetical case, okay? If this was to be cleanly awarded to National Express today, can others file a protest during a debrief within five days and still bring it back? Whether we put anything in the motion or not, isn't there an out for the other vendors? It's, different kind, of, it's a different kind of protest. It, it's, it's a different stage of protest. It's a post-award protest. And the reason that, the reason for the importance and the distinction here is because the pre, if, if the basis for the post-award protest is the same as the basis for the pre-award protest, then if you didn't file a pre-award protest, you're prohibited from pursuing legal action against the authority. So it, it limits their rights in that regard. Okay. Okay. So that's why there's the distinction. Um, that's why you would open it back up to, you, you would reissue the notice of intent to award and, and restart the protest five, process. Five days. Okay. That was the part I was going to include, is that we need to withdraw the current one because okay. we want the time clock to start when the other one is issued. And so part of my motion would include then the withdrawal <laughs> plus the um, yes directing staff to authorize the executive director to begin to negotiate an agreement with national but also affording the other vendors who want to debrief with rich and but that the executive 
director would also make sure that the chair and the vice chair are included in that debrief. That's what I said. That's it. Well, I just wanted to make sure that <laughs> since I, I'm the, since it'll be attributed to me as the maker of the motions. This whole thing's attributable to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. As usual. Okay. Does that make sense to you too? It, it has to, otherwise we won't let you go to Washington. Let's get this over with so we can go to Washington. <laughs> Good idea. Is there a second? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Let me ask a question. It's probably everyone's on everyone's minds. I don't think and so. And that would be, you have a ranking of one through five. Mm -hmm. Let's say we go through all the, the, uh, uh, the, the interpretation of everything that's been stated or not awarding the bid at this time. And it comes back that we'd like to award to number five, Merced Transit Company. My first question is, why go through the bidding process? And number two, will we be penalized in any way with federal funds for selecting the number five ranking as opposed to number one? First, first part of your question is, if, if we reissue the notice of intent to award, that's not going to change the process. It's not going to change the score. It's not going to change the interview process that we went through. To say the recommendation comes back, we want to award to uh, number five as opposed to number one. What's that going to do for federal funds? I, I don't think that we can do that. I don't think that you can choose somebody other than who was chosen through the process without redoing the entire process. We'd, then, we'd certainly be in otherwise, otherwise, there's no purpose for the process. So I don't understand the purpose of, of these other motions. Then. I don't either, but okay. it's moving along anyway. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to stop it for a minute. Could, could I speak on this for one moment? This is, this is, a, this is not a uh, construction contract. It's not required by law to be awarded to the lowest bidder like those types of contracts are. It's a service contract, so there are different rules in place for this type of contract. You do not necessarily have to choose the lowest bidder. There is no law that says that you do. Whether an FTA would ding you if you didn't is a different question that I believe we don't have an answer to at this point, so it's something that I think we need to look into. We should have had that answer months ago. We could have avoided I, a lot of this discussion. I, I, we do have the answer. I'm sorry to disagree okay. with legal. I, I um, we do have um, our procurement policies that this board has adopted that outlines this process that very clearly says that we have to abide by this process and have this evaluation done by um, the, way, the way it was done. So, and we, I certify every year when, when we submit our transit grants, federal transit administration grants, and I think our budget is like two to four million, and I don't know what it is today, depends on CMAQ money, mm -hmm. but this four million dollars that we receive for this service, I certify that we follow our policies every year, and it's probably three inches thick that we have to go through to make sure that we do this. So if we do not follow our policies, I'm not sure if I can sign that document. So my point exactly, I mean, we're keeping everybody in limbo, everyone in suspense. These poor individuals want an outcome for or against. They want to know. And we went through a process. The process was outlined. And during that process, it was never talked about where other people would review. And so here we are, and now we're proposing other avenues. Well, is the outcome going to be different? I don't know. If it is, let's just cut to the chase. And why go through this process? Let's just award it now to the, uh, where, where everyone, uh, the people, the no votes thought that uh, they, they might want to be going. I don't want to continue this thing over and over again. If, if, it's, if, if there's going to be a change of outcome and we can do that legally, let's just get it done. 
Come on, you guys can't hide your feelings. Everybody knows where we're going with this. Mr. Chair, if I might respond. To I'm something. done. Director Walsh. Uh, first, we have a motion and a second, and uh, Mr. Villalto could be in power to do exactly like some of the other folks here is vote no on the motion. But the ith other issue, this discussion is about transparency and just frankly making sure that the vendors, I'm not suggesting that we're going to change the outcome on these uh, of the recommendation. I'm just saying, why don't we afford folks the debriefing and why not afford folks here on the dais? And so I have a motion and a second to that. Uh, to the effect of, of moving forward with this process, affording staff the direction to continue the kind of negotiations, but also having a, a debriefing opportunity. That's all, and I, so. I don't oppose that. I don't oppose, I don't oppose any discussion. I don't oppose transparency, but we went through this over and over. We all had a chance to comment on how this process was gonna go. The process passed, and now it's, it's, uh, it's you wanna outline a different process. So uh, I'm okay. If you wanna do that, I'm okay with it. But I'm just telling you that what are the underlying reasons for doing this? Because if we have options and we can just say, okay, Merced Transit Company, number five, you can have it. We shouldn't have gotten through this process to begin with and then we shouldn't have put people through grief. Let's just do it. Thank you. Real quick, um, the transparency thing is the, one of the, the concerning things that I have, but also the two other companies that were here and then they were basically fired or terminated and we, we scored them higher than the Merced Transit, which I have no idea. But another question I have, and this will probably come out in the debriefing, is if it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Riggs had said, um, by what I understood, and I might have m misinterpreted it, but he already had planned on raises, a higher wages, where was all the companies planning on the same wage? Was it based on the same wage? And I don't know if that can be said here or can be said at the debriefing with the chair and vice chair sitting in in the debriefing. That's all I, I am asking. Mr. Uh, let me, let me Mr. Say. Chair, could I call for the question? Yeah, just one second. Uh, aren't they going to negotiate with the union? Why, why would we interfere with that? I don't want to interfere with the negotiations between drivers and unions. Anyway, uh, Director Walsh has called for the question. Is anything else anybody wants to? Roll call vote, please. Director Pedrozo? Aye. Director Walsh? Aye. Director McDaniel? Director Kelsey? Aye. Director O'Banion? Yes. Director Price? Yes. Director Oliveira? Yes. Director Samra? Here. Director Vialta? Yes. Director Thurston? Yes. Thank you, board. I think. <laughs> board. <laughs> B O R E D board. <laughs> Only because you're Curtis Riggs. And could you mind showing your beautiful face to the cameras? We're, we are recording this. It's going to be uh, put on television now. I didn't want my presence here to cause uh, a bunch of consternation. I just want to comment on the, the protest thing. Uh, because we did, in a timely manner, file the pre-award uh, protest. We don't really have any disagreement with sub substantial other than what you've read. What's doing, we, we had to do, the way the procedure set up, if after the award uh, we wanted to protest for whatever reason, we wouldn't be allowed to do that had we not filed the the pre-award. So that's why that protest was filed, kind of was to keep open our options. You have a good legal counsel. It doesn't mean we're necessarily <laughs> going to take that any further. Just so you'll know, to the, uh, and maybe this is something that ought to be changed for the future. I'm not asking to be changed now. But normally one would protest if one saw what the other bidders had and he said, wow, that doesn't make any sense. Why did they do that? 
well, the, because of the time constraints with FOIA and stuff, we're not going to, the, the time period's going to lapse. We won't be able to file a, uh, a knowledgeable protest because we don't know what's in the other bidder's packets until later. So it's just set up to where the, the information isn't available in time to do it. And that's the way the system is. But maybe that's something to change down the road. But I thank you for the, what I sense is a feeling of, of support, uh, particularly for the folks. And uh, we'll do everything we can to be sure that transition is smooth for them. Thank, thank you. you. Item 18, uh, purchase and improvements of a transit ops and maintenance facility, Director, Executive Director Kernigan. Mr. Chairperson, members of the board, uh, we've identified a piece of property that's available at a good price. It's, uh, we did an um, appraisal and it's actually below the market value. So um, uh, I'm asking for permission to purchase the property and to begin the design and engineering for a maintenance facility. The schedule, I've been optimistic. I thought, it, could we get it done in six months? I've been told by engineers that's impossible. So uh, we're looking possibly at a, a year's transition to get something up and running. So, But this is the first step in um, acquiring the property and getting it um, for a new maintenance facility for transit. Questions by the board? Director Petrozzo. <clears throat> OK. Uh, so. Uh, Probably it's going to take, I mean, realistic, we know it's going to take a while. So we are in a, uh, an, a contra, I mean, a, an extension with the county. But, uh, Rich, you said it was going to be three months. But is it going to, it's, is it for until things are done? I mean, that's, that's what. Yes. Um, basically, we're going to have to negotiate a, a lease oh, okay. for, for the time beyond October 1st. So we will negotiate that with the county. And um, they've been great to work with. Yeah, and I so understand that things have been going well. So, yes. Okay, thank you. thank you. Anything else? Is there a motion? Second. You have both of those? Do we do first? John. John, thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, Executive Director's report. Mr. Chairperson, uh, the only thing I have on my executive director's report is we're having our meeting at the June, the June meeting at the landfill, and we'll have a tour prior to, and I encourage you to check out the landfill. And the last thing is we have a big group going to Washington, D.C. next week. I, now that this meeting's over, I can look forward to that trip. Thank you. Director's report, starting with Director Price going to the east. Whatever. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, nothing to uh, bring out to earth shattering other than uh, I would uh, humbly ask the public to support our 4th of July uh, fundraising in the city of Atwater. It will uh, commence this Saturday uh, with a motorcycle um, poker run and winding up at Veterans Park, formerly known as Castle Park. Uh, 15 bucks for a great barbecue dinner. If you don't wish to participate in the barbecue, you can still come out and listen to live music and have a good time. Hope to see you there and support the 4th of July. Thanks. Say the music says Saturday night? During the day. Are you playing? There's a remote possibility. He, is, he brought a friend of his from Reno who's one of the best guitar players I've ever heard, so... If you can tell them when you're going to play and Danny's going to play, I, I recommend showing yes, up. Yes, we, we, we will be there in place 4 till 7 o'clock. And uh, my friend Danny, as Dan has uh, graciously said, is totally blind and plays guitar like a wizard. Thank yep. you. Director McDaniel. <laughs> Aren't you bringing your piano? Director Walsh? Nothing? Okay. Director Walter. <laughs> I'm, I think they're very happy about that. <laughs> I'm not playing anymore either. All right. Okay. No Dr. report. Oliveira. No report. Hey, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Livingston, I always like to advertise. Uh, I understand uh, Mayor Price, uh, Director Price's uh, promotion for, uh, for Outwater, but we're not the ones to outbid them. Uh, we invite everybody to help out Livingston, too, and we do have the largest uh, 4th of July uh, fireworks in the valley, and we guarantee it. So mm. come on, folks. Well, what happens yeah, if, I wonder about What that. happens if ours proves to be more? 
What, yeah. What's your guarantee? If I have to throw another sparkler in the air, match one inches, we will do that. It That's will be nice. the biggest. That water is pretty extensive. Yeah, but we always do that, you know. So. How much does it cost? Thank you. And we do not charge for anybody to come in view. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Pedroza, before we get in trouble here. I'll see. Um, be, I'll be going to one by voice with the whole conglomerate of people. I think this will be like my ninth or tenth one to go into. So, <laughs> anyways, I look forward to that because I think there's a lot of uh, important uh, issues that we're going to be bringing up, and hopefully, we get some uh, good response from uh, some of the people that we talk to. Anyways, so I, I see you next month. And it was my idea to switch this meeting, just so you know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I have nothing to add. Um, is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you.